The LLC half bridge is the go-to power supply topology for when you need some serious juice. This topology is commonly used to design power supplies that can produce up to 1000 watts of power and provide electrical isolation to the user. In this video, we are going to do a complete walkthrough of the LLC half bridge topology. We will explore essential aspects of the design, including key components, theory of operations, and other important fundamental concepts that you need to know in order to understand how this circuit works. As usual, there will be some links in the description that you may find helpful, so feel free to check those out. And now, Let's just get right into it. So before we get into the key components of the circuit, I want to do a little background for the LLC half bridge. The LLC half bridge is a type of resonant converter, meaning it operates using a resonant circuit made up of inductors and capacitors. In the case with the LLC half bridge, there are two inductors and one capacitor wired up in series, which is where the two L's and the C come from in the name. The circuit also uses two MOSFETs in a half bridge configuration to control the behavior of the resonant circuit, which is a key mechanism in the power conversion process. Like with the flyback converter, the LLC half bridge uses a transformer, so it can be configured as either a step up or a step down converter, as well as provide electrical isolation to the user, which is a requirement by a lot of safety standards. So now that we have some good background on the half bridge converter, Let's talk about the key components that make up the circuit. So unfortunately, TI's Power Topologies Handbook does not have this circuit in there. So instead, what I've gone and done is created a circuit diagram that we will use as a reference when discussing the key components of the circuit. The first component, or should I say components that we will talk about, is going to be the pair of MOSFETs that make up the half bridge. As we just mentioned, the point of these two MOSFETs is to control the behavior of the resonant circuit. When the high side MOSFET is on, the resonant circuit will be connected to the input voltage source, and when the low side MOSFET is on, the resonant circuit will be connected to ground. We will talk more about how these two MOSFETs work together later on in the theory of operations section. So when it comes to selecting MOSFETs for the LLC half bridge, you'll want to be familiar with parameters such as the drain of source voltage rating, your current rating, and your power dissipation rating. One important thing to note about the LLC half bridge is that it operates in what is referred to as zero volt switching mode, meaning that when the MOSFETs are switching, there is zero volts across them, so you're not going to get any switching losses during the operation. L1, C1, and the primary side of the transformer make up what is referred to as the resonant circuit or resonant tank. If you're not familiar with what an LC resonant circuit is, the key takeaway is that this will create a scenario in which energy oscillates back and forth between the inductor and capacitor. This results in a sinusoidal current waveform that has a frequency that is equal to the resonant frequency of the circuit. We will talk more about how it functions when we get to the theory of operations section. For the resonant inductor and transformer, these components are usually separate, but in theory, you could combine them into one. The parameters that you'll want to be familiar with these two are going to be very similar. Things such as your current rating, your inductance value, your saturation current rating, and thermal performance. For the transformer specifically, you'll want to be familiar with a term known as leakage inductance as this will impact the inductance value of your resonant inductor. For the resonant capacitor, parameters such as your voltage rating, your passivance value, your ripple current rating, and your equivalent series resistance are all important. Usually a film capacitor is chosen for this application because they can offer very high voltage ratings and very low ESRs, which is a requirement for the high frequency signals that this capacitor usually sees. Another important thing to mention is that the film capacitors can also offer very precise capacitance values, which is also very important for an LLC half bridge because your capacitance value typically ranges in the tens of nanofarads. So you need something very precise. Okay, so let's talk a little more about the transformer. If you haven't watched the flyback converters for beginners video in this series, then I encourage you to do that because we talk a lot about how the transformer works in that circuit, and there's a lot of knowledge that will carry over into this application. Some of the key takeaways are that the transformer provides what is referred to as galvanic isolation, meaning that your primary and secondary windings are not actually electrically connected. Instead, they transfer power 
wirelessly through their shared magnetic fields. The transformer relies on its primary winding producing a changing magnetic field in order to induce a voltage in the secondary winding. The construction of the transformer in an LSC half bridge is somewhat similar to that of a flyback, but there are a couple key differences that I want to point out. So your primary side is going to be pretty much identical to a flyback converter, but then the secondary side is in what is referred to as a center tapped configuration where you'll have three pins on the output. Two of them will be your positive output voltage, and then the third pin is going to be a shared return path between the other two. And we'll see how this works when we get into the theory of operations more, but that will just give you an idea of what the purpose of those three pins are. Okay, so the next pair of components in the circuit diagram is going to be your rectifier diodes on the secondary side. These components work together with the center tapped secondary side in order to fully rectify your output voltage signal and direct the current through the output load. The parameters you should be familiar with when selecting the rectifier diodes for this application are going to be things like your reverse breakdown voltage, your current rating, your forward voltage, your power dissipation rating, and the thermal properties. LLC half bridge converters often have very high current outputs, so it's not uncommon to see something known as active rectification where instead of diodes, we use MOSFETs to rectify the output signal. This improves the overall efficiency and thermal performance of the converter. So the last component on this list is going to be the output capacitor. The purpose of the output capacitor is to smooth out the ripple on the output voltage waveform and provide a clean DC signal for the load. When it comes to selecting an output capacitor for your application, you'll want to be familiar with parameters such as the voltage rating, the capacitance value, equivalent series resistance is very important in this case, and so is the ripple current rating. Typically for LLC half bridge applications, you'll see an aluminum polymer capacitor used because those can offer really high ripple current ratings at high switching frequencies, as well as the low ESRs that you'll need. Okay, now that we've gone over all of the key components in a circuit, now we'll talk about the theory of operations. There are a lot of moving pieces in this circuit, so what we're going to do is break it down into different sections. Okay, so first let's start by analyzing the switching behavior of the half bridge. The two MOSFETs in the half bridge will switch in complementary pairs, meaning that when one is on, the other is supposed to be off. It's actually quite critical that these two MOSFETs are never on at the same time, Otherwise, that will create a condition known as shoot through, which is essentially where we short the input voltage source to ground, which can have catastrophic consequences. So when the high side MOSFET is turned on, the resonant circuit is then connected to the input voltage source. Current will flow from the input voltage source through the resonant inductor, through the primary side of the transformer, and onto the plates of the resonant capacitor. The resonant capacitor will continue to charge up until its voltage has become higher than the input voltage source's voltage, at which point current will start to flow in the reverse direction. Right as that current change starts to happen, we will switch off the high side MOSFET and then switch on the low side MOSFET, so the resonant circuit is then connected to ground. This will give the resonant circuit a low impedance pathway to sort of discharge itself and current will flow the opposite direction until the voltage of the capacitor actually sits way beneath ground, at which point current will want to start flowing the opposite direction again. Then we will just repeat the process of switching back on the high side MOSFET and the whole process will start over again. This will create a sinusoidal alternating current waveform that flows back and forth across the primary winding of our transformer. There will be a frequency at which the resonant circuit will naturally want to operate at and this is known as the resonant frequency. It's the frequency where the converter is most efficient and it is determined by the value of your resonant inductor, your primary side transformer, and your resonant capacitor. The MOSFETs can switch in a way that makes the converter operate outside of its resonant frequency and it is necessary to do this at times in order to account for variations in your input voltage as well as your load, but in general the converter will always try to operate at its resonant frequency. So when it comes to inducing an output voltage on the secondary side, it will be very similar to what we talked about in the flyback converters video. Essentially, we have a changing current on the primary side, 
which is what we use to induce a voltage in the secondary side. In the case of the LLC half bridge, it's a little bit different because we are using both halves of the switching cycle to transfer power into the secondary. And this is actually one of the reasons why we need to use a center tap transformer, and that is to help rectify the output voltage signal. So let's take a look at what the secondary side of the transformer looks like during the circuit's operation. So when the current through the resonant circuit is positive, you'll see that current is flowing out of the bottom pin through the rectifier diode and then through the load and then returns in through the center pin of the transformer. So notice the importance of the rectifier diode on the unused pin. If that weren't there, what would happen is current would just completely bypass the load and return through the top pin of the transformer. So what the diode does is, is prevents that from happening and routes the current through the load as opposed to back through the transformer. And the same exact thing is true for whenever current in the resonant circuit is negative. You just have a reverse polarity where now the top pin of the secondary side has current flowing out of it and then it's being routed through our load and returns back through the center pin. And then the bottom one is preventing any current from bypassing our load. Okay, so now I wanna go over some frequently asked questions that I often hear when talking about the LLC half bridge. The first one is, what is zero volt switching and how does it work? So as we kind of talked about earlier, zero volt switching is whenever the MOSFETs switch on, there is a zero volt voltage drop across them. And this is to avoid incurring any switching losses in the MOSFET. The key to understanding zero volt switching is to think about the current in the resonant circuit. So it's an alternating current waveform, meaning it has a positive half cycle and a negative half cycle. So that means at some point, the current in the resonant circuit is zero. And so if we think in terms of Ohm's law, we know that if the current in the circuit is zero, that means the voltage in the circuit is also zero. So really what happens is as soon as that current in the resonant circuit hits zero, we switch the other MOSFET on. And so it's turning on with zero current flowing and therefore zero volts across it. So that's kind of the crux to understanding how the zero volt switching works. Okay, so the next question is, why do we use a center tapped transformer on the secondary side as opposed to a like normal configuration? The short answer is we actually could use a normal configuration on the secondary side. The reason we don't use a normal configuration is mainly due to efficiency and thermal reasons. If we used a normal configuration, we would require two additional diodes to act as a full wave rectifier and so essentially what would happen is that would double the amount of power losses in the rectifier portion of the circuit. So your efficiency would decrease significantly and you have worse thermal performance as well. Okay, and the last question is, why do we use a sine wave for the resonant circuit and not some other type of waveform, maybe like a square or even a triangle wave? And I think this is a great question. Besides the fact that the resonant circuit naturally creates a sine wave for us, so without doing any additional work, we can get that clean sine wave. There are actually a lot of advantages to using a sine wave as opposed to some other waveforms such as a square, triangle, or even a sawtooth waveform. And the main advantages really have to do with something known as electromagnetic interference. To give a short explanation, anything other than a sine wave would cause more EMI problems due to the additional harmonic content that those waveforms inherently have. So a sine wave is the cleanest and easiest waveform to work with from an EMI standpoint. We are actually working on an EMI from the ground up series. So we will detail pretty much everything you need to know about EMI there. So don't worry if you don't know a ton about it yet. And that is pretty much everything I wanted to cover in this video. Thank you so much if you made it to the end and hopefully I will see you in the next one.